Welcome to Responsible Chicken Keeping and or Breeding. And look what I've got. I've got Jim. I'm so excited to have him back. I forgot the name of the show. <laughs> How are you, Karen? All right. Hot. It's hot. Is it hot in North Carolina? Yes. And don't you have the air conditioning turned on in your studio? I don't know. Once you put these lights on and you, <laughs> and you get a little nervous, you get hot. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you have allergies, too, from all the crazy stuff floating around in the air. So, wow. So how I, I got to ask, because everyone, you know, you post this thing on Facebook. How's your tractor? <sighs> It's You're back done at the, your tractor. Yeah, it's back at the shop already. Can you believe it? No, you are I, kidding me. Well, What's wrong with it? Nothing. I sort of cheated there. It is back at the shop again, being fitted <laughs> with a wood chipper and a stump grinder. But no so, way. Yeah. What in the world? Taking out wow. some trees, and then we got to do something with it. I learned my lesson. I take out trees <laughs> all the time, but then they just sit on the ground and rot and make a snake den. So we well, got to yeah. do something with them. So. Oh, uh, you know, when we miss a week and then last week you were with Jeff Maddox and uh, thank you, Jeff. I don't know if Jeff will listen in, but he might. But you never know. Word gets back to him. And, and uh, I mean, you guys covered a lot of serious um, calcium and all. You know, that's Jeff. You get to talk feed. But you know what? Feed is what makes your chicken perform to what it should. Feed is just a little bit important. So thank you, Jeff Maddox, for filling in last week. And um, so and we've got, hey, you and I are getting ahead of we got guests lined up for many shows to come. And so this yep. is good. This is good. So um, next I have week a special what? Next week we're gonna try to record live while Jim's actually in Africa. Anybody yeah. have any guesses as to how that's going to go? No. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I actually fly to Africa tomorrow, and um, we are um, we're we need to do an Africa report. But I'm looking at we're evaluating three different breeds that we're trying to develop, or we are developing. We're not trying to develop them in Senegal, Western Africa, and um, but meanwhile, I'm really really excited about our show today because we're talking about. Not only one of my all-time favorite breeds, but we have the coolest guest. You are going to, you're going to love her, and uh, I get to be on a show with two women today. I'm kind of excited. So, uh, is that all I'm supposed to say at this point? I'll, I'll do. I'll do. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay, people, breed of the week. Have you ever heard of a place called New York, upstate New York? That is where the wine dot was developed. But before we jump in, we have a guest, and uh, she's going to be on the whole, do the whole show with me, with us. And uh, it's uh, it's Abigail, and we always chop up, I'm going to try and say, Watake, Wataki. How'd I do? Karen. <laughs> well, let her come on and tell you how you did. Yeah. What techie? What techie? I wasn't that far off. You now listen, one of the things we gotta start off here right at the beginning of the show is I need grace and patience from you two ladies. <laughs> so here she is, Abigail. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on. And um she, uh, I'm going to say it this way as we introduce the breed of the week. Um, she is especially into the different colors of wine dots. And, you know, I love white wine dots. And I think Jonathan Patterson, my one of my favorite wine dot breeders. But, you know, to some people, white is kind of boring, and uh, that's the way it is with Abigail. She's like, I don't know about white chickens, but <laughs> <laughs> so we're introducing, we're doing wine dots, and um, I, I will just say this. What I remember, Abigail, about when I uh, was learning and reading about wine dots is they were developed in upstate New York. Am I getting that right? That is correct, right? Yes. And uh, they were intended to be. I mean, I tell her, you know, I, when I'm teaching on wine dots, I'm like, listen, upstate New York, I say, what's the weather like? And they say, it's cold. 
Yeah. So the inventors of the wine dot, they wanted a chicken that would be productive in the cold weather. So they put a rose comb on it and it's a, a short, stocky bird. It's got depth of body this way. And, and um, so um, it's a great breed. And I should also say, and we were talking about this earlier today, is that I first got some silver laced wine dots. Um, it was a lady, she's been gone many years, but her name was Jan McDougal. And she had a, a, a line of silver lace wine dots from an old guy in Oregon named Cy Lewis. And I got my hands on some of those silver laced wine dots as a teenager. And they were awesome. They were awesome. And so actually, when I look at the cover of your book, I'm like, oh, that looks like my boy I had back in the 80s. But um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, as you can tell, I I, um, I love Silver Lace Wine Dots. And uh, I'm very, we're very honored that you would come on the show. And Abigail not only has been, um, yeah, here she is. Not only has she been breeding Wine Dots for a number of years, and we'll get more into that later, but she's also written uh, and published a very cool book that we will talk about later as well. So what am I doing here, Karen? I'm so, I'm like a kid in a candy shop. Do I, do I uh, turn Abigail loose here and let her talk about some of these pictures? Well, you let her talk about the wine dot. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You go for it, Abigail. I want to sit and listen to you and look at these cool pictures. So. All right. So I'm a little biased. I love wine dots, but I think one of the reasons why I think they're there's just an all around great bird. They're good for table. They're good for eggs. They're extremely mild mannered. They have awesome colors and they can be really good moms. So like with my Wyandots, it's one of the things that everybody comments about when I go to the show. I They're the most mild mannered, easy birds to handle. I could put one of my large fowl roosters I can set him on a table and I can leave him there while I do something else. And he'll just stand there and people are just amazed. <laughs> oh, I love their personalities. They have, they have great personalities and they're, you know, they're a lot like right now I'm breeding New Hampshire's and they're a lot, my new ham and, and they have a similar personality. You know, the girls are talking to you when you come out to see them and the, the boys are looking at you at the corner of their eye, just kind of checking on you. But um, I love their personality, but go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess with Wyandots, one thing, the Silver Lace was the first to come about. And from there, we kind of went with Golden Lace. And then you got the sports of white and black from that. And it gradually trickled off from there for all different colors. The, how they originated is this big mystery. Nobody really knows how they came about. It's They did research on it and they would just go to a trail where I'd get it from Bobby, I'd get it from Joe, and then uh, the trail <laughs> yeah. <was> okay. <laughs> So they're originally referred to as uh, the American Seabright. And then I remember that, yeah. It kind of like turned into the Wyandotte because there are people that said that they use Brahmas. There's other people that said they use Cochins. And then there's just all kinds of different birds and breeds all pushed together. And then they made the Wyandotte. So yeah, it's like yeah. cropped up on the East and the West at the same time with different people. And then, so it's one of those, it's just, it's almost like they just burst into existence. Yeah. Which we know it didn't happen, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it's a little bit perceived you know before we go any further i think it would be good here um obviously you have a love for the breed and um tell us a little bit i want to talk history with wine dots and abigail for a minute you've been breeding what do you say uh ele about 11 years you've had them you no know, i think i started in 2009 and I remember my first silver lace I got from Jerry Folly for my 19th birthday. My dad drove me out to Kentucky to meet No him. way. Yes. I think that is cool. I'll tell you, I've been to Jerry's place. And that's like showing up at Wyandotte Heaven, wasn't it? 
Oh yeah, that's like, I think I had had silver lace for a couple years before that, but I needed some good ones. So I drove out there and then Jerry was like, oh, by the way, you want some of these partridge? I'm trying <laughs> to have them later on. I was like, why not? I'll take, I got a pair of them and then it just like snowballed. Now, did you get, did you get adult birds or chicks? They were like young juveniles for the, okay. and then the silver lace were adults. I think I got okay. a quad from him. Okay. And then I think I also got some bantam silver pencil, but I had gotten rid of those shortly after I believe to somebody else who was working with them. But the now, listen, I realize you're special, but not just anybody gets wine dots from Jerry Foley. I, I mean, <laughs> you're special. So, so, so you were in 2009, you were about 19 and, uh, and you got silver lace and you, he hooked you up with some partridge as well. I think, I think I wasn't even 19 in 2009. I wasn't 19. I think it was two or three years later. Okay. I went out to Jerry's, but I had had some silver lace, but there were nothing like what he had. And I remember yeah. talking to him on the phone, just like, oh, I, I heard you had that. <laughs> That's the way it is when we're young and we get to be around incredible chicken breeders, right? Yeah, exactly. And thankfully, Jerry was like, oh, yeah, come out. I have chickens. And I came. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> So Silver Lace were the kind of the love of your life in the beginning, right? Yep. I just yeah. I love the pattern. They just, when you see a Silver Lace wind out walking through a yard, it's hard not to like turn your head and watch them. I mean, they're oh, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And then so kind of walk us through kind of what happened along the way, because you don't have the Silver Lace now. So kind of give us a recap of your breeding story the last 11 years. So I start out with Silver Lace Wyandots, and I basically kind of was on my own. I was just trying to figure it out. My parents raised show dogs, so I knew enough about breeding and standard. So, and I made a lot of mistakes, and I did. A, I had to learn a lot of hard lessons. But as I went through, I'm like, why isn't this information easier to find? And mm. it's, it's like I'm like clawing and trying to track people down and figure out answers to things like like for the rose comb and figure, somebody explaining it to me and being like it needs to be the texture of your tongue and then <laughs> that's and then, great yeah and it's like an easy way to explain it like oh that makes sense because before all the birds i'd see that were like this guy they're very coarse so i thought that that's what's winning. That's what they're supposed to be until somebody explained it to me. And so, wow. it's, and basically, you know, in all my chicken years, <laughs> the comb should be like your tongue. Yep. That is so basic and yet so profound. How have I missed that all these years? <laughs> See, I knew there was a reason to have you on the show. Oh, hi, Karen's back. Hey. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was funny. This 1905 standard, even at the bottom, it's like, see diagram of fowl, page 12 for ideal YN dot comb. Like, yeah. they had to be very specific there. They couldn't be like, this is a good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, even with the illustrations, it's like, you look at them, you're like, you look at that one, you're like, oh, it's really like lots of little bumps on it. And then it's like, the fur if you look at the originals i did of like the ideal wyandot heads if you look real close i actually had to go over it again because i did the texture too coarse and when i showed i think it was jerry and a couple other guys and they're like that's too coarse and it's like you got to change that and i'm like what <laughs> that was, so yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah because that's not just changing it for your book that's changing it for your breeding yeah, yeah. Changing, yeah. It for breeding, changing it for the book and it's like oh it's like all this information and i was like i need to make this easier for other people because there's a reason why people don't breed the pattern birds or some of the other birds because they they get these vague and it's like sop it's like once you know what it is it's easier to interpret it. Like when I read it, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But then somebody that just gets thrown book, they're like, I, I don't know what this is. I don't know what flex yeah. is. I don't know what wing carriage is or tail structure. And it's, I just wanted to make something like that. That was like my journey with Wyandotte breeding is figuring That's out. so cool. 
Yeah. So then along the way with your silver lace, you got some from Bill Guardhouse in uh, in Canada. So you really, I mean, when did how? Why did you reach out to him? Actually, Bill got birds for me. Oh, I, excuse you know, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I had met him up in uh, at uh, Columbus one of the year. It was like the year I was. I think the year after I had made my book and I finally, like, I had the courage to be like, oh, are you Bill Guardhouse? <laughs> <laughs> and I showed him my book and he's like, and he was showing his buddies and stuff. He's like, this girl knows what a Wyandotte is. He's like, so, and he like, I don't know, now we just get into trouble whenever we're around. So, and then he hurts on me about the birds. I tell him to watch his back. I'm coming for him. <laughs> yeah. So let me just let me just say this to all of our listeners and those who will enjoy are enjoying this show. We we call our show responsible chicken breeding. And what Abigail is referring to is the fact that when you really begin to understand the breeding of standard bred poultry, you realize and, and you learn that it's great breeders who are preserving these old historical breeds of poultry. And Jerry Foley and Bill Guardhouse are two very, in the last probably 25 years, are very pivotal, instrumental in breeding of the Silver Lace Wine Dots. And, and obviously, there's others. Um, Jonathan Patterson breeds the whites, but I think his dad breeds the silver lace. But anytime, and when this is what Abigail was like, oh, I'm in this beautiful little, I get to meet these people. Yeah. And, and really, that's what we need more of across America is people like Abigail who meets these breeders. And she's like, oh, yes, I got to go in the same chicken aisle as Bill Guardhouse, you know, and. We're not really trying to, you know, put these people high on a pedestal like they're God's gift to the chicken world, but actually they are. We're just honoring them for their great faithfulness and hard work to to developing the birds. So um, obviously, when did the partridge begin to kind of speaking of a partridge here? When did it begin to kind of share with us a transition from all right, silver lacer? going out the door and I'm going to focus on the partridge. Tell us about that. So I had gotten the pair from Jerry just kind of as like, huh, just add some more chickens to the farm. <laughs> and, and somehow I came across a trio from somebody else. I still have no idea what lineage they came from. It was some lady who had no idea what they were and I got them. And I had been breeding them, focusing on the silver lace, but then the more, I started to show, the more I realized the only colors I would see are white, silver laced, and blue laced sometimes. There was really, that was it. It was pretty much just yeah. white wine pots. And then slowly I was like, I want to add some color to the, to the things. When I go to a show, I don't bring like three birds. I bring, I'll bring 20 partridge and I'll bring- That's so cool. <laughs> So like I flood the aisles because whenever I travel, I figure I might as well bring 35 birds. So yeah. wherever I go, there's pattern everywhere. And the first few times I was showing partridge, people would find me and they're like, where did these come from? I've never, I haven't seen these in 20 years. It's like, how did you get these? And then I kept bringing them to like the Ohio National where I knew they weren't gonna win anything, but I wanted to show people like I'm working on this. This is where I'm going. And there's lots of people that are like, they saw me at the beginning and they see where I am now. And I think that's part of like why I go to shows, <clears throat> these rare breeds. I finally, in the past year or two, nonstop, people are contacting me for partridge. Oh, but I bet. The, when I, I first used them, I couldn't give them away. Nobody wanted them. And now that like I just flood the halls with them, I talk about them, I'm sending them out to different places and people are finally like, they're starting to get popular. They're popping up more. And, yeah, that and Abigail, that's a total compliment to your work. <laughs> 
And and what a privilege it is for us to to have you on the show and to to spread the chicken gospel specifically about about wine dots and um, especially the multicolored wine dots. And so um, I think you told me earlier you've been working with the Partridge now for about eight years, right? Yep. Okay. And you're seeing progress. I mean, I'm, you're seeing some good stuff here in the pictures. Oh, yeah. And you didn't get these pictures somewhere else. These are from you. Oh, yeah. All mine. <laughs> That's so cool. And you also, and recently in the last couple of years, what have you started working on? Uh, another color. Yes. I started working on large foul silver penciled wine dots because I'm a sucker for a challenge. What can I say? <laughs> Wow. Um, I don't know. I, and now I've I've seen some of your pictures, but, you know, I have judged a lot of chickens in a lot of years and very seldom. I don't even remember the last time I judged a, a silver penciled wine dot. So nope. but you'll probably have. Are you going to take some of those to Columbus this year? Oh, I sure am. <laughs> oh, cool. That's so cool. Well, you, uh, um, that's great. Well, uh, I don't know. My mind is racing. What else do we want to talk about here before we do our deep dive? What would you add, Abigail or Karen? Yeah, let her talk a little bit about the purpose of the bird and the egg color and all the little stats. From okay, her. sorry, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. Go for it. So... Wyandots can lay a light tinted brown to a darker brown. Some of my silver lace line for, I don't know how it happened. They started laying a darker brown, which is nice. But basically it's just kind of a spectrum of cream to brown tinted. So, and then one of the things I always focus on is I want them to be a good table bird. If I'm raising a bunch of large fowl birds, I better at least get something that is worth frying up. So that's one of the things I always try to explain people when they come over is the fleshing of the bird. And most people would say like, what do you mean the fleshing? And it's one of those where you pick up the bird and you feel it around the breast and along its thighs. And it's like, you pick that bird up, is it worth cooking? Like if you miss the meat, that's what you want to cook. It's just a skinny thing where it's like the keel is bent in. You don't you don't want to waste your time processing something like that. So that's something where it's like you gotta lift them up, and if they're worth eating, then they're good to breed. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. That brings me to a thought, Abigail, along the lines of introducing the breed. Um, we talk throughout, you know, and, and I continue to teach this and monitor this is that even with dual purpose breeds, I tell everyone, you know, even what we call dual purpose breeds, almost most birds have um, a primary purpose. Like people don't realize that a Delaware in its initial development, it was a meat chicken and we turned it into kind of a dual purpose chicken. And it was and a Rhode Island Red, well, I won't know. The New Hamp is a meat chicken, you know, and but there are a few breeds like the Wyandotte, the Buckeye. I would put the Rhode Island Red in this in the sense that it's a true dual purpose, meaning it's like kind of like a farmer's fowl that you can. It's not more of an egg layer than it is a meat bird, and it's not more of a meat bird than it is an egg layer. And wouldn't you say that? Those who develop the wind up, that's what they had in mind is an equal value of a dual purpose bird. Am I saying that correctly? Exactly. exactly. And that's like before they called them wildcats, <laughs> they almost called them the Eureka bird because it literally ticked all the boxes. It's meat, eggs, broody, takes care of itself. It's good for winter. It looks nice. It's just, <laughs> it was like the perfect bird. So. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. So what other little history piece would you share there? Or do you have you covered all the basis of the breed of the week? I'm trying to think. There's another comment. Add the Chanticleer to the dual purpose from the beginning. And that's true. 
That is true of a Chanticleerin. I get rebuked by Karen. It's like, don't be looking at the comments. It takes us down a rabbit trail. But, you know, the Chanticleer is, you know, it was meant to be a, a, a good, hearty, meat balanced egg chicken for Canada. So that that's very true. So and anything else you would add before we do the deep dive, Abigail? Um, I think that's it. That's all I can think of right now. Now this little guy in the picture, oh, she's, that is that a, a Bantam on the left, number 11? Huh, that's actually a large fowl. It's just the oh, way yeah. that taking the picture. He's standing, yeah, okay, okay, cool. All right, let's, um. oh, look at all these guys. I know, these hunks, so that's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so these are all guys off of your farm, obviously, huh? Yeah, that's one thing. I whenever I look at my males, I have pretty small hands, but I always make sure that when I put my hand on their back, that I can't wrap my hand around them. So because yeah. that means they're too narrow. So I always have really wide males, which means they have more room for meat on them, and they carry that width from head to tail. So yeah. especially like the partridge on the side, you can see he's just he's built like a brick. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the cool thing about this partridge, he actually looks like he has more width than the silver lace. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's very, very unusual. That has to be somebody is breeding chickens and they know what they're doing. They're being very responsible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so did you find like with, um, oh, she took it away, but that's oh, all right. No, I can put it right back. <laughs> Did you find like with the with uh, the heads, mm -hmm. real similar heads? Uh, that's one thing. I also I try to get a wide head. Wide body equals wide head. That's what I found. So if the head gets narrow, the body starts to get narrow. So it's yeah. probably, you got to check wide tail base, wide body, wide head. Yeah, so. yeah. Now one more thing, Karen, before we deep dive that I think is extremely important with these two males. Um, <laughs> uh, I love this. Who's this Shaggy Elwood? I'll be watching this episode over and over and over. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Anyways, but what I was going to say is, um, uh, and, and this will bleed over into to uh, deep dive, but um Male line versus female line. Here we have two males and, and people, it's so important if you're listening and especially if you're interested in breeding different colors, not only wine dots, but this is applicable to well summers and a few others when the males and the females are a, a different color and the way the, the, the feather, the color pattern fleshes out in the two sexes is you end up with a, a male line or a female line. And if you look historically, those of you, when we talked about Bard Plymouth Rocks a number of weeks, um, several episodes ago, is in the early days, you had a male line and a female line of Bard Plymouth Rocks. And the same was true with a lot of these wine dots. So Abigail, explain that a little bit. What do we mean a male line and a female line? And then we'll kind of jump into the deep dive. So primarily with pattern birds, people tend to have male lines because especially with like, if you looked at the partridge and the silver penciled, they have black breasts. They don't have pattern. So they're much easier to master than a penciled bird. So most of the birds that we have in North America, Canada, they're all male line because they're the easier ones to breed. I have a female line because why not? <laughs> and, but the thing that I- You do, like the challenge. Exactly. <laughs> and huh. to make it even more challenging, I have the female line, but I still make it so my males are showable. So this is an example of like my silver laced, the males, I still want them to have clean silver. I want them to have clean black lines. So if you look at the, what was it? The um, number four and number two feathers, those are actually saddle feathers. One thing that happens when you start breeding for a strong female line is the male sex feathers get shorter and fatter. 
and they actually look more female because it's such a strong female line. So, mm. And if you don't pay attention too much, then what happens is you start getting brown in the colors. You start getting like the, where the black line is, it gets a little fuzzy, but I'm a ruthless person and I, I didn't want that in my line. And <laughs> <laughs> we just put That's good. Yeah. So it's, it's hard, but it's possible. So, and yeah. that's the thing where it's like you add pattern, which is already hard. And then it's like, Hey, by the way, make the males showable. And it's just like, most people are like, I'm out. That's too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that, that launches us into deep dive. So we're going to take this a little deeper in the color. So here we go. What do you think of the music? Isn't it cool? Yep. <laughs> Karen's brother made that. I'm just like, I, I finished the show on Mondays and I'm, da -da 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 -da. I just keep singing it for the rest of my day. So anyways, we are, we're deep diving. And so all you listeners, Abigail has um, sent us and shared with us some incredible photos of specific feathers and, and real life pictures, as well as some of the artwork that she's printed and, and published in her book. And uh, so we're just going to, you're going to learn a ton. I mean, by the time, and I love this person, I can't remember who said it, but the reality is, is this is a show that can be shown over and over and over for even new people who want to get into, to wind up. So, um, Karen, think, you're going to have to harness us a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, and I'm going to actually not going to harness. I'm going to join you and put this entirely out of order. But I feel like we've talked about her book too much without <laughs> showing her book. So let me just take one second here. And um, so uh, I keep trying to ask her where to buy it, and she's not telling me. So <laughs> I'm going to just say that the paperback is e readily available on Amazon. Um, and the um, digital edition is available if you email her, but Jim's showing it to us up there. Um, and Shaggy, for saying such a nice thing, has earned himself a copy from the show. If you uh, email me, Shaggy, at responsiblechickenbreeding uh, at gmail.com with your information, we will get one sent to you. So Nice. Um, nice. But, now, and, and I'll say, well, since we're, you want to talk book right now, Karen, um, Folks, I have been, I have seen a lot of books and there's a lot of crazy, not so good chicken books out. And, um, but when I heard Abigail and I haven't actually met in person, um, that day is coming. I don't know when, but, um, but when I found out she wrote a book and cause I've seen her pictures and we've dialogued a number of times on email and, and, uh, on Facebook and so forth, but this is incredible. Now I have the old and and the an old Wyandot publication book that was I forget what year this is probably um, probably nineteen and uh, let's see if I can find a quick year, but it's published by the Reliable Poultry Company, and um, I can't find the year. But this is the this is the kind of thing. Now, Abigail would say, please, Jim, don't put me in reliable poultry journal level. And but this is a phenomenal resource. I will um, when I'm teaching and traveling around the country, because see, wine dots, silver lace wine dots are huge in, in England. And I've judged poultry uh, all over Australia. And they would eat this up. And uh, so I am a huge advocate of, um, and I hope your book sales just skyrocket and you and your lovely husband can go on a honeymoon, an extended honeymoon. You never know, right? So, all right, I'm done. Uh, I'm done promoting her book. So go to Amazon, look it up. <laughs> all right. So I, you guys, 
Did you want to say more about these, Abigail, or did we cover them enough? Um, it has over 150 original illustrations <laughs> and over 75 photos from me. Very much. So anybody from beginner to expert, I mean, take a look at it. It's easy to read because it's made for pictures. <laughs> um, and we'll 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 throw some more pictures up from the book up Hang at on the now. end of the show, or maybe now because Jim just. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I don't have them labeled though, so I'm struggling. Oh, let's talk about this while he's gone. <laughs> So I've heard rumors that you do art in addition to books, that you do stuff on commission. Yep. Is that? Oh. You should have muted while he was. I can mute him. Hold on. I can do that. Look at that. Ta-da. There we go. Um, actually, I'll even, I'll even remove him off the screen. Okay. So, um, so I've been doing a lot of logo work. So I hadn't been, life has been kept keeping me busy and I hadn't been able to do a lot of artwork and I just kind of jumped back into it. I've been doing a lot of farm logos for people and, and it's been real fun to work with people and seeing the birds and just really like bringing their logos to life. Yeah. This one was really cool because it's it's transparent. I had to put the white thing behind it so oh, yeah. that they can put that on anything because I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't work. So, <laughs> but no, I like it. Um, are you doing? Uh, this is out of the blue and probably not a right question, but are you doing stuff for the yearbooks? Are they? Yes, are you, okay. I've been doing some of the ads for the yearbooks. So okay. I can't remember how many. I did a couple of memorials and I've done a couple of ads too. So okay. hopefully we'll be able to see those pretty soon. Yeah. Like that. All right. So we're he's still he's still gone. So we're gonna whoop, go backwards. We'll look. So like I said, there's some more pictures. I I I don't have my copy yet. Jim didn't. Get, we thought we had one for both of us, but that didn't work out. Um, <laughs> but um, I was saying how much I like these kind of pictures because I did not grow up with chickens. I did not get any chickens at 19. <laughs> so, or 15 is what it more sounds like. Yeah. Um, and so just figuring out the different parts of the birds and people threw so many, so many. So I thought these were really good, helpful, helpful, especially when you have pattern birds like you do. That's just, yeah. um, but showing all the different, all the different parts of the body. Um, so, all right. Well, I don't know. What do you want to talk about while Jim disappears? Yeah. <laughs> um. Let me think. Yeah. No, we're good. Oh, I have other questions here. Let's see. Yeah. Do you, uh, are you doing any more? Are you, have you considered another book? <laughs> I have considered another book. I've been thinking about doing one that's basically all pattern rather than focusing specifically on Wyandotte. It would basically be able to be used for any bird. So it'd cover lacing, penciling, depth of color. Because uh, with partridge, American partridge is different from European partridge. Mm. Where, like, ours is based in mahogany, while Europe, it's more based in gold or it's a diluted. So, and yeah, uh, that sounds that's not going from one color that you can be very specific to going to everything in the whole world. That's like you yeah. do like things difficult, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, that's why. Um, Originally, I had gotten out of the silver lace mainly for the purpose of so I could focus on the large foul silver pencil because not a lot of people were working on them. I knew the silver lace were in good hands for people. And I figured I have the foundation of the partridge and I've actually been splitting them into the silver pencil. So because with the silver pencil, they've already had even my pure silver penciled have brown in them so i figured i'm just gonna throw my partridge in there because there's already brown i might as well add something good to it <laughs> so um um oh yeah i know one other thing okay for breeding and that i can't i don't hatch a ton of chicks only the past couple of years have i hatched like 150 chicks so that's something where like most people think with the pattern they're like oh you need to hatch hundreds upon hundreds of chicks to get to where you need to go you really don't 
there was a long time where like I could only hatch out 80 chicks for the year. And that's how I started making my line. So where I wish I could hatch out 500 chicks, <laughs> uh, but because of my setup, my schedule, and just honestly, large fowl eat so much food. They're yeah. very expensive. <laughs> So, and it's something where, I don't know, I think that scares people or they think they have to hatch so many chickens, but they really don't. It's basically like the ones that you do hatch, it's raising them to their full potential and then just knowing ex knowing what to look for in order to progress your breeding program. Yeah, this is this is that time of year where where you're like, oh gee, they ate my birds ate 43 pounds of feed yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right, looky who we have. <laughs> so sorry. A precious friend of ours, she rolled her vehicle. Oh my she god. Was in a yeah, they were in a terrible accident. Her blood sugar went down, and so she was running here to let me know what was going on. So I comforted her and and prayed with her and one of her friends took her to the hospital. So I'm back. I'm so sorry. That was kind of an abrupt leaving, wasn't it? No, yeah, for important reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you, where are you at? You guys just kind of bring me in here. Yeah. Well, you're going to start talking about patterns. patterns yeah. You didn't I, talk about any patterns while nope, I was gone? We talked, we talked about her book and her breeding. Yep. I, I, oh, okay. I took it easy. I didn't want You love these pictures. I'm not taking your... <laughs> Didn't want to do them with yeah. that. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, and, and again, if I used to share something, then forgive me while I was away there for a few minutes. So talking color pattern, uh, Abigail, uh, you were talking about, is this, I can't, that's a male, isn't it? Or female? That's a male. So, so I'm sure you added this in because normally they have a, a black breast and you want to come in and explain this and our color pattern issues, huh? Yeah. Well, this guy what was it. This is one of the silver lace I had. And you can tell he's my line because if you look at his skirt and how thickly laced his skirt is, I had a super laced line where... I still had good exhibition males, but I pushed their lacing to the point where like their breast lacing basically spilled over down to their um, their skirts. And if you looked underneath their tail where their fluff was, even that was laced. And it's like, it's one of those where it's like, I pushed the lacing to like the extreme with them where I guess this is something I do when I have a female line, I just, I push it to the extreme. I remember hearing when I was a kid, the old timers, um, look at how the lace comes all the way down by the hawk joint, you know, all the way down on the hawks. And, and, uh, so that's exactly what you're referring to, huh? Oh yeah. That's like the female up on the screen right now. She actually isn't even that heavily laced for what I usually have on my females. Yeah. So me, I mean, would... this is good lacing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is good, good lacing. And uh, I love how if I had a pointer and I was in a class, just the lacing on the secondary wing feathers and and um, just how clearly defined that is. It's absolutely outstanding. And those of you who are listening, you would be like, are you kidding me? How are you? Yeah, that's the key is if you have an eye for this, if you want to be a responsible chicken breeder with wine dots, you got to pay attention to these things, right? Yeah, because that was one of the things I didn't really pay attention to wing markings until uh, probably like five years into it. My male's wings, terrible, trash. I hated them. <laughs> so my females were pretty decent. But in the last like year or two that I had had the silver lace large fowl, I, I think I crossed in birds from Tom Roebuck to... Thank God his improved my wings because everything else about the birds looked great. And I was like, just don't open its wing. It's like they had nice tight wings, but just, just don't look at the color of the wing. <laughs> yeah. 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 So and talk to us about this here. Um, what are you trying to point us out there in picture 20? So in picture 20, this is a good example of a strong female line male. So you can see how those, that is basically the length of his saddle feather all over him. So you can tell it's very short, very fat at the end. You can see there's some slight 
discoloration, some mm -hmm. brown ticking in there, which is from being a strong female line. And that's basically, this is what happens when you have a strong female line male and you're very strict with their breeding. So like if I wanted to be basically like not care about the males, like I only want to have exhibition females. I don't care what the males look like. It would be a brown mess. And, it would <coughs> and actually that male probably is not attractive. Huh? He was... He was one of my okay ones. He had a brown tint to him, but his type was so good that I tolerated him. So I was very, um, very strict with his uh, male offspring. But I've had some males that popped out. You would not know they were from female lines. Right. But was, see, what happens is, listeners, you need to catch this. When you're, she knows what kind of feathers she needs to have on her males to produce good color in the females. Am I saying that okay, Abigail? Yep. Basically, the male on the right is going to produce the lacing that you see on the left that consists of breast to the end of the back because that's the one thing you want consistent lacing from breast all the way to tail tip, which awesome. is really difficult to get once you get to the cushion that's where things just kind of go haywire and it's real difficult to get that defined even lacing once you get that right it's like wow so and the reality is is some people might <coughs> see the male on the right number 20 they might see him out in the yard and go oh bad color call mm -hmm. him yeah. but if you understand breeding and understand silver lace color specifically, you realize the importance of this. So listeners, don't miss this. It's very, very important. So let's go to the next picture. Because that's one thing. Even when you're working with color, you got to do type first. Yeah. Because if you call for color, then you're you're shooting yourself in the foot. It's yeah. really difficult because there you could have an exquisite specimen that has perfect plumage but if he does if they don't have good type don't use it <laughs> yeah 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 and we we preach that on every episode you know we actually you know we say type over color and we put vigor at the top and uh so that's good so um tell us what we have here i mean i see incredible partridge color here she is one of my favorites as you can see she has penciling that's consistent from breast all the way to the tail, even in her cushion and her um, uh, in her skirts, completely penciled, same thickness, even color, except for the hackle that's haunted me for years. I've only recently been able to get females that are have a darker neck, and it's like I take one step forward, four steps back for that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, in, in picture 22, the, um, the partridge color pattern looks so distinct and clear mm -hmm. and I can see the wing markings too. Uh, yeah, right there. I mean, that's, that's really, you, you know, that partridge color better than I do, but that's really good, isn't it? And that's over near, that's almost at the end of her cushion too. Right. Which, once you start getting to the primary tail feathers, that's where everything kind of loses you lose definition. And for her, it's basically like almost all the way to the tail. You have that penciling. Wow. Wow. And, and uh, the penciling, the black penciling, mm -hmm. that's not too narrow, is it? No, I've had, I had uh, way back when I first started, I had some that were thin, much thinner than this. And then I had others that were much thicker. And basically I kind of played with both of them to see, cause I was told it was like, it's basically a preference. So I tried to see which is more visually appealing. If you went with the really thick ones, then when you stood back and looked at them, you couldn't see the mahogany, you couldn't see their base color. And then if you went too thin, when you'd stand back to look at them, you couldn't see the penciling. So yeah. I kind of, this is like the happy medium where you still get that defined pencil but when you stand back, you can still see the base color. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that next picture, um, this looks 
disastrous and you know why. So explain yeah. it to us. So this is the um, hackle feathers on my, I'm probably the female that we've been showing. And this happens because the penciling is so extreme that it moves its way up the neck. And it's one of those things that's like, it's one uh. of the with having patterned birds is if you want the really nice pattern, you're going to have this. And if you want the dark black, if you want the defined neck, you're going to lose the penciling. So it's, ah, over. so this is actually good. Yeah. So it's like in the standard, it says it should look different, but it's one of those where in practicality, ah. that's why it's like, it's so difficult because you're always dancing this line of like trying to get the color, the right thing, the right like the base color it took me a long time to get the base color consistent through the body. I used to have it where the wings were kind of a darker shade and then it'd fade out onto the cushion. And then I finally, even though it's not a dark, dog, it's at least the same color. Yeah. So in a sense, what we're looking at here in picture 26 yep. is you, that's good. And yeah. if it's that good, then most likely her neck might not, exactly fit the color description of what the standard says. Exactly. So yeah. and something that's like, do you, I will prefer, I usually prefer the body of the bird being better penciled than focusing on the neck. Cause most I would agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. Cause like you can kind of see it in the picture 27 here. If you look up at the top left where there is some solid black parts, but you can see that there's kind of that penciling spilling in. Yeah. So, and one thing that it threw me for a loop when I first started breeding partridge, the babies come out barred. So you can see it in the, the um, in the skirt of this female, cause she's kind of a, she's a pullet. So, cause you can see that there's, you can see some penciling, but you see barring as well. And I think there's a picture on here that has a baby chick that's barred. Mm. And it me through a loop when I originally started breeding. And I'm like, I thought they're supposed to be penciled. Why do they look like this? This is so odd. And I even talk to people nowadays that, um, that, have, uh, that have been raising birds. And they don't know that penciled birds feather in barred. Like it's technically still penciling, but looks barred. And yeah. then they they become penciled. So yeah. And yeah. the cleaner the barring, then uh, the better the penciling is. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Stop there, Karen. Let's talk about um, this is one of your um, silver penciled, correct? Yes. Now talk so, a little bit about that color pattern. Is it totally it, different than partridge or similar or how would you compare them? It is exactly the same as partridge, except it has a silver base versus a mahogany base. So same thing, just white. <laughs> so, but the problem yeah. is the most silver pencil females that I've come across, they're all male line. So they're very muddy color. There's brown. They're not really penciled. This is actually a female from a split mating that I did where I had a silver pencil male over partridge females. So then the babies, the females come out pure silver and then the males come out split. So, mm -hmm. and I use quotations for pure silver because my silver pencil, and I think most in the States, they already have this brown leakage in them which a lot of people were kind of up in arms where they're like, oh, you can't split partridge into there. You're introducing brown. It's like, it's already there. I'm just adding some good stuff there. Yeah. So, and I'm actually really shocked on how fast I've been able to clean up the silver. That's so cool. And picture 36, the male on the right, <laughs> he is pure silver pencil. And then the female in 36 is the same in 37, and she's a split female. You can see how she has the more defined penciling. And I was surprised that the first cross I did to my partridge, 
actually like kicked in the penciling that strongly. Mm. So it's been. I love that male. I know you said he was kind of uncomfortable or in position, but that is an incredible looking male. Yeah, I I was genuinely surprised on how nice the males are, and for type, for color for size like you should see like their legs are like this thick around my bands uh, like i always have to update my bands because the ones that are record <laughs> are too small yeah yeah wow very cool very That's cool hilarious. talk so, about uh, this so this is the male that we just saw you can see on his saddle in 28 how you have that nice defined black diamond with that white on the side. That is exactly what you want. Like that's what I want in my males, whether they're female line, male line, I don't care. That's what I want because that just like, it helps enhance the color of the females, makes the males really stand out. So I'm really curious, like, the things you're like, this is exactly what I want. Did you, did you, is that a combination of learning from other breeders, reading books, trial by error, uh, breeding yourself, or is it, is it all those things? Or what would you say mostly you develop those, uh, that knowledge? I think primarily just through me breeding and kind of trial by error. Mm. So, and it's one of those things in the standard where the males are supposed to have that saddle. And I'm like, well, dang it. I want my males to have that saddle. I don't care. <laughs> if you're female. It's like, I don't care if you're female line, you're going to have good saddle color. So yeah. even my males, usually for female lines, they have color that spills into the black. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We don't have that here. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That's oh like, my look at him like he's a female lined male most people would think that he is a male line because he has such crisp color and it's just something that i have been ruthless with my males and with my line to get what i want mm. so, and so why my- is he how what can you tell us from the picture to know that he's a female line or you can't without picking him up and looking through his color honestly the only reason i know is because i bred him if you show okay. him to somebody they probably couldn't figure out he was a female lined male they would think that he is an exhibition or a male line because he doesn't have leakage in his breast he has clean saddle feathers and he has clean markings throughout which is usually unheard of in a female lined male. Mm. Mm. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> Let's talk. Is this, you like this color or tell us about him? Yeah, I think this is still, I'm still trying to get an even mahogany color on my males. I've almost gotten it, almost. You can see how his, how the mahogany color in his wing is darker than what's on his saddle and his hackle and that's Mm. something that getting the same color throughout has been it's very hard it's difficult there there are times i go down to the bar and i want to rip my hair out because i'm like why can't you just be the same color and it's like i already have to (laughs) yeah Uh, that's one thing i tell people if you don't go down to the barn and feel like ripping your hair out or kicking a hay bale over at some point then you're not in it. Like you're going to get upset. You're going to get frustrated. And yeah, if you say that's you- exactly right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Keep talking. Uh, that's like this saddle. Like I really like this because this has the nice defined diamond in it and just seeing it from the side. It's just, it's so striking mm. that to get that defined mm. color males if you look on the male on the right you can see that he actually has shafting which the only reason i kept him was because he had extraordinary type Mm. otherwise i would have been gone yeah which one are you talking about has she has shafting number 29 yes yeah i see that okay okay 
And that's and something if you don't have good type and you got shafting, he's out of there. Yeah, exactly. And surprisingly it's, enough, oh, sorry. That's all right. Explain what shafting is, Abigail. Shafting, when you look at the feather, you have that hard center that basically holds the feather together. That's the shaft of the feather that all the webbing comes off of. And it's right. very common in lots of different colored birds, like whether it's a solid color bird or a pattern bird, the shaft, for some reason, it tends to be a different color if you don't pay attention to it. Yeah, 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 it's, uh, it's a no-no in a lot of different yep. colors, you know, so uh, how like about him? Him? He's pretty good. You can see a little bit of the mahogany bleeding into the black. But this one, I think, was also a cockerel. So mm -hmm. it's one of those that's also very frustrating with Wyandots and pattern birds. I won't know the true pattern of the bird until they're probably 18 months old. Uh. So a lot of it is just kind of, at this point, I can kind of like look at a bird and figure out probably what it's going to look like, but I won't get a definitive answer until they go through at least two adult molts. Yeah. 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 So cool. Do we have any pictures left? I forgot I came on. No, we're at the book, which we already sort of covered, but I'm going to let you guys talk about whatever you want. We're over time. I know, Jim, you need to, now you need to go to a different emergency than you thought you were going to have to go to at the beginning of the show. So. Yeah. Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, I, I uh, we need to have Abigail back on the show. And I think that uh, we could continue to expand on, on her knowledge and, and what she has to offer. But I definitely, because I am a book person, you know, those of you who are listening and, and uh, we've, you know, we've had some great comments so far. I would encourage you to really go to Amazon and, and get her book because you might go, oh, I want to ask this question or, oh, I'd love to expand on that thought or what about this or what about that? You know, a ton of that is covered in her it's called the visual guide to the Silver Lace wind up. And so I would encourage you to check it out. And um, I mean, is there anything, Abigail, is there anything you're like, this is one of the most important things I wanted to say and I haven't said it yet. Is there anything like that comes to your mind? Um, I really can't think of anything. It's like, it's, I don't know, we've been going on tangents and just talking and then it's like, we have. man, I haven't been yeah. able to look like that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a little, this is just the way I, you know, with our show is I have things that I'm like, I want to make sure we tackle this and we talk about that. And I ask this question and what about this and what about that? And I've, uh, I've, I've covered my list, but we, we, um, we are very honored to have you on our show. And, uh, when I told Karen, that you were coming on, she didn't even go to bed that night. She just stayed up <laughs> celebrating and partying and excited. And um, so actually, I went right to bed because I said, Oh my gosh, I'm gonna get good pictures and I don't have to panic about it. So <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was relaxing. Yeah. 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 So um, I think I would close with this Abigail, we need more of you and, <laughs> and being young and passionate and. I love how you articulate toward specific color issues. Those are hard things. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> frankly, you probably know more about those color patterns. I could learn so much from you, and I, I long for the day when I can spend a few hours at your place, and that will happen at some point. But um, so I, I, a huge thank you for not only from Karen and I, but and all the people who are enjoying this and and the people who will buy your book. And, um, and we we're very honored, very blessed to be able to have you on the show. So thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It was really fun. <laughs> all right. All right. You Thanks all have everybody. a great time. And, uh, we'll remember you, 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 can, you, 
Yeah. yeah, and you can look in the thread if you want to email Abigail about artwork or about chicks. I hope you get so many emails. You're like, people stop. I, don't, I can't <laughs> sell anymore. There's nothing more. I have no more time for artwork. So, Abigail, you're a real blessing to the poultry world. So thank you very much. And you all have a great rest of the day. Karen, thanks for kind of keeping us on track. <laughs> all See right. you all. Have a good one. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.